The Publishing for Profit podcast is brought to you by Ghostwriters and Co. Earn more money by publishing better content and learn how to increase your thought leadership so you can build your brand. Head over to ghostwritersandco.com for more information. That's ghostwritersandco.com. And now, your host, Joel Mark Harris. Hello, and welcome to the Publishing for Profit podcast. This is your host, Joel Mark Harris. Today, we are interviewing Brian Hennessy, who is the author of a new book called Too Old to Hire, Too Young to Retire. And although it's a book that is aimed at baby boomers, it really is applicable to anybody uh, in any age generation. And it's really some great life lessons that Brian has learned through his extensive uh, career as a commercial real estate agent. Uh, So we talk a lot about uh, ageism, we talk about retirement, but we talk about what he's learned throughout his life that can help people navigate uh, their career, their family, whatever problems that they come up uh, with. And we talk obviously a lot about marketing and sales and how those uh, specifically can help you in your career today. So great conversation, very wide ranging. Uh, Brian is just full of great knowledge and I know you'll enjoy this conversation. Hi Brian, how are you today? Great, Joel. Thanks for having me on today. You're very welcome. So I wanna talk to you about your uh, new book out. It's called Too Old to Hire, Too Young to Retire. What's what prompted you to write this book? This is a book that has been on my mind for literally the first time I heard it was in 2015 when I heard the term in a seminar I was attending. But it hit me like a ton of bricks and the seminar leader that was speaking said something to the effect that there's a lot of you in the audience here that are too old to hire and too young to retire and I thought wow I I know I could write a book on that and I know exactly what I'd want to say and I just kind of put that in the back of my mind because up to that point I had only written one book and was working on my second and it all had to do with uh, uh, my co- commercial real estate career. And I was, I was gonna write a series of books, which I've written three books in that series. I'm not sure if I'm gonna write any more in that series, but as for right now, I've got three out. And, but that this book, I started writing in 2018, but I was still working on my third book. And I said, I, I just have to finish that first and then, when I get that done, I'll work on the tool to hire too young to retire. But uh, as life would have it, you know, things get busy and you keep saying, I'm gonna get to that, I'm gonna get to that. And then the pandemic hit. And that's when all of a sudden I had a lot more time on my hands to think about these things. And I started writing the book and it really was quite an experience because it was really the first book I had ever written that I really didn't have a fixed subject per se. Um, And it was basically taking all of the tips and strategies and lessons I had learned over the last 25, 30 years and compiling them into a succinct, uh, just roadmap, so to speak, of what has helped me and what I know to have helped others. And I thought this is really the perfect time for this book to come out when um, people really are gonna need the help, especially during this economic tsunami that we have experienced and are continuing to experience. So, uh, and the reason I I really, the, the information in the book could be useful to even millennials uh, were looking to get a foothold on uh, 
uh, starting careers, et cetera. But I, I really felt like the brunt of this tsunami is going to be felt by the boomers, like people in my generation, and even some of the Gen Xers uh, that are uh, out there now and starting to experience the uh, the age glass wall, if you would, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where uh, it's starting to uh, it's starting to be more pervasive and for, for many more reasons than we ever had before. So in the introduction, you talk about how you were passed over for a promotion because basically they said that you, they were looking for somebody younger. Did that, I mean, that kind of surprises me because you're obviously super successful. You're really good at what you do. And like, you have all the qualifications for somebody that, you know, you would, I would assume that you would be perfect for the job. So why do you think it is that people are looking for, you know, maybe a younger candidate? Well, that's, that's a great question, but it, I think it really encompasses whatever uh, industry that you're in for the particular industry that I was in. I was actually seeking a job position and was told that we're looking for somebody younger. And um, that was probably somewhere, uh, let's see, 2011 or something like that. So, uh, but it was the first time I really had heard that. And it was kind of a, uh, just an epiphany that came about saying, hey, this is, this is the real deal. This is what's going on out there. And really made me make the decision that, hey, you know what? You're really better off uh, continuing to be an independent contractor <laughs> and going out there, you're probably gonna have more security, mm. right? And, um, but I had two kids, uh, one that was going into college and one that was, uh, that was in college, one that was going into college. And I was like, I was trying to create, a, you know, it's a regular income stream uh, during a time when, you know, the country was climbing out of its economic hole of, uh, you know, the, the Great Recession, which I think uh, pales in some respect to what we've gone through or going through, you know, <laughs> currently. So, but um, it was a, it was, was an eye opener for me. Gotcha. And so you've written books in, in commercial real estate before. How like I imagine it was a very different process where, you know, with the commercial real estate, you, you have all the information at your fingertips, you know, the, you know, the industry inside and out. Was this a different book to write? And if so, how? It was very uh, introspective and it was, it actually evolved because what happened was I started out, I was gonna write it like a typical book with just a bunch of chapters and expound on different things. And I thought to myself, well, wait a second, uh, things are changing so rapidly. Maybe I should just make it so I'm giving bite-sized uh, bits of information and, if, and then give them some resources if they want to delve deeper into that particular aspect of it. So by the time the reader gets through the, the book, they will have a 30,000 foot view of everything that's available to them. And then go back and pick the ones that they wanna uh, dwell more on and feel more uh, that it resonates with, mm -hmm. with them. And so um, it was a process and it was an interesting process because there was many times when I sat down to write and it was like, what do I say about this? Or what, you know, how do I approach this subject? Or how do I, you know, that type of thing. And then partway through it, I thought, well, uh, maybe what I should do is give them some ideas of how they can get unstuck, at least get the wheels turning and so they could start thinking about it. 
And uh, so I started taking that direction with it. And then at the back of the book, I, I put uh, a bunch of resources that people could uh, access and, and look into. And um, after having a bun bunch of people read it and give me their feedback, I ended up making some revisions based on some of the uh, uh, ideas that they had. And uh, I'm actually quite satisfied with the end result and um, uh, happy that I went through the effort. And like I say in the book, I, if it helps one person, uh, I, it would have been worth all of my effort. But I think there's a, a number of ideas in there that can help people though. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in commercial real estate? I've been doing it for a long time, um, over 35 years. So um, I've seen it evolve like many other industries out there. And uh, it's been a great industry. It's, uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's commercial real estate. Right? Mm -hmm. And I've had the great pleasure of working with some really, really good people. I'm in a pretty dynamic market, which is the Los Angeles market that I work in. And uh, so I've been very uh, blessed and fortunate to uh, have been in where I was at the time that I was when I got into <laughs> it. And uh, so I felt like, and then I, and I ended up working in different facets of it too. I was a, uh, acquisition disposition executive for a major investor and his investors. And then I had my own syndication company, done brokerage and done just asset management, a lot of different aspects of it. So um, I have have a different feel than most people that have been in the industry because a lot of them stay in one lane from that aspect, uh, I've been very fortunate. And uh, the first book that I wrote was really not even meant to be a book for public consumption. It was a reference manual that I wrote for myself because when I became an uh, acquisition executive, I was overwhelmed by the amount of information that I had to review. Hmm. So after the first couple of transactions that I uh, got taken to school, on, I decided to not reinvent the wheel each time and wrote a manual for myself, reference manual, which I added to uh, throughout uh, about a six year period, six or seven years. And um, anyway, I ended up putting it on Amazon because when I went back into brokerage, I didn't know how to differentiate myself. I had been out of the industry for that amount of time. And so uh, it was like, how do I do what I was doing before? It's changed. Nobody seems to be all that interested in, you know, wanting to talk to me when I want to go see them or something. Because <laughs> they have their fingertips on the internet, so they figure, uh, we've got all the information right here. Yeah. But uh, when I did that, I found out that people found the information interesting. You know, I was only going to use it as a marketing piece. Never thought I was going to sell one copy. I didn't even bother paying somebody 150 bucks at the time to create a cover for me or anything, right? And it ended up taking off. So um, it's still one of the top selling uh, commercial real estate books on Amazon. And I'm happy that I have was able to help a lot of people with it. I, I That's really what turned me on to writing was when I started getting the emails and phone calls from people saying, thank you so much for sharing your information. It's really helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow, after, after the first one, you kind of think is fluky, right? <laughs> and then the second one is like, wait a second, somebody else thought it was, you know. And then the third one was like, wait a minute. People are starting to tell, you know, there's a pattern here. Somebody, people are thinking this is helpful. I, you know, I, this is what keeps me going here, you know, so. So I would say that's probably the impetus of the, the last book that I read, wrote. And am I going to write another book? A lot of people ask me, I, I, I don't know if I will. I'm not, I, I will say this, I won't write it unless I have something to say, right? 
It's mm -hmm. different if you're a novelist, right? Because your mind is working on different novels all the time and what have you. They, that would be a great novel or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're sharing uh, information, um, nonfiction, business type, self-help, however you want to categorize it, um, you know, that's, that's different. You know, it's a different genre, so... What would you say are, you know, maybe if you could distill your book, I know this is, might be a little bit difficult, but if you could distill your book into like three, like the three most important points that would help somebody who's trying to transition later in life, what would those be? It's a really good question. Uh, not a simple question to answer. <laughs> Well, I'll try to break it down mm -hmm. okay? because there's the there's the mental part where we have a tendency to get in our own way, right? With the mm -hmm. mind chatter and all the nonsense that self-imposed limitations that we put upon ourselves and uh, through a myriad of factors that could have happened in our childhood or whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to allow yourself to put that aside and be open-minded and even embrace a paradigm shift that you might come across that says, wait a second, that sounds really, really interesting. I think I could do that and ignore the mind chatter that says, no, you can't do that. You've been a whatever for the last 25 years or whatever the case may be, right? Then there's the, uh, the physical part that a lot of people um, tend to treat secondarily. And I would say, especially as you get older, it's more important because really, if you want to change your life around and you don't have the energy to do it, or if you've got physical ailments or things like that you have to deal with, it makes it really, really difficult to do. And without sounding too trite, you know, if you have no time to pay attention to exercise and you will pay for it later, <laughs> right? It's not. You know, if this is going to happen is when it's going to happen. So I always tell people, don't take it for granted. Just make it part of your daily and start changing things up. You know, that uh, which challenges us changes us, right? So, you know, you have the ability to change yourself because it starts up here in your consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. And once you, you make that decision... That's the first step. And then it's a matter of you have to keep making those steps until it becomes a habit. But, uh, and then finally, but not lastly, because uh, I make it first, is your spiritual life. Because uh, if you're not paying attention to that aspect of your life, then you're really out of balance. It's kind of like, you keep writing checks without putting money in the account, right? What happens? You run out of money and you start <laughs> start uh, running a big deficit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same with your spiritual life. You, you, you have to have some kind of daily routine where you uh, pay attention to whether you call it God or the universe or infinite intelligence or whatever you want to call it that works for you, uh, you have to tap into that source and allow yourself to center yourself and allow that peace to saturate you so you're able to handle the vicissitudes and the crazy stuff that life throws at you on a regular basis. And I really call it exercising your faith and courage muscles and your you know, your, your spiritual muscles, really, because 
if you don't have that and you get blindsided by something in life, turn into a basket case because you had nothing to turn to, right? You're, you're in the middle of a dark desert and you don't know which way to turn, right? So by making that part of your regular routine, what happens is you're prepared. When this stuff hits you, you've got that place, that eye of the storm to go to where you're centered and you're clear and you can think clearly and you can handle things clearly. Hmm. It sounds like these are shifts that you should probably make sooner rather than later because a lot of people, I, I, I assume they like to think or tend to put them off. So when should somebody think about um, a career after their career, so to speak? Well, let's just say they're at a company right now that they're seeing red flags popping up or yellow flags, whatever you want to call them, right? And they're downsizing and they're resizing and they're shifting uh, responsibilities and, you know, redoing, uh, you know, certain aspects of the company and outsourcing it and what have you. Well, if I were in a company and I was watching that going on, I would say, hey, uh, I need to be figuring out some other uh, avenue in case they come to me tomorrow and say, hey, you've been a great employee, but some things have changed here and we're not going to be needing this department anymore, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. right? they, have, they have a million euphemisms for them. So, um, you know, <laughs> you don't want to wait until then. I would say start working on it now because it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next year, it could happen three years from now, but it could happen, right? And the fact of the matter is, if you're doing that, you may find that that is something that gives you more satisfaction and, and gives you, you know, more enthusiasm for getting up in the morning and, and getting going. And uh, you could be embracing a whole new world you didn't even know you were excited about. And that's what I tell people. Give yourself a chance. Don't take the blinders off. Take, you know, you know get, don't, don't be a, a, a worrier. Be a warrior. Go out there and say, hey, what's out there? What can I start working on? What's, what's interesting? Start making yourself uh, basically start paying attention to those things because you don't want to get blindsided with that. It's it's just it, it, it's a tough way to go, you know. And even if it's just making a transition, maybe you say, "Hey, I have no I, I, nothing. I feel like I want to do independently right now, but I you know maybe I should look for a new position somewhere or." a new company, a startup or something where I can add some value and not be worried about these folks I've been working for for the last 15, 20, 25 years. And they're thinking about their bottom line, how big their bonus is going to be. And they're, fi they're figuring out ways to make that happen, right? <laughs> and some of it means getting rid of people because it goes right to the bottom line, right? Mm. So, uh, especially now, I, you know, I, I, when I talk about this stuff, I, I tell people, look, don't, don't take it the wrong way, but don't bury your head in the sand either. I mean, with artificial intelligence and blockchain, all this stuff is, is coming down the, the, the track so fast that by the time it gets here, you will be blown away what it's the changes that are being made. And you just can't take it for granted that you're going to be able to hang in there until you know, you can retire or whatever the case may be. The other danger is, hey, the, your pension fund might not be there when <laughs> the time comes or whatever. <clears throat> and it's not that it hasn't happened before because it has, you know, so it's just a smart thing to do. It's a prudent thing to do. And um, there's not, doesn't mean everybody's going to do it, right? But uh, those who do will look back and say, man, I'm glad I had the foresight to uh, be thinking in those terms when that happened. So, um, and I wouldn't have been in the place where I'm enjoying myself so much or 
making more money or whatever the case may be. Maybe living in a different country, who knows? But it's just, uh, it could be a game changer. Are there, I mean, I think future proofing yourself is something not just for the older generation, but for everybody. And I think it's something that everybody should worry about. What, are there some skills that you can learn to help, you know, prevent technology? Because even like my, you know, profession, you know, as a, you know, creative writer, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not going to be taken over by AI one of these days. So is there, are there skills somebody can learn that will help future proof them and hopefully prevent them from being obsolete in the future? Yes, I think there is. And uh, in the book, I go over some of these things and I'll, I'll go over like some of the basics. One that's probably close to your heart is copywriting and marketing, because I don't care what business you're in, you got to get people to pay attention to you. I always said that the internet, and these are obviously for people my age that were around working before the internet, but when the internet hit, it was like, it was such a game changer when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is mind blowing, you know, what this, this is doing. It's kind of like, the, probably like the printing press was when, you know, the Gutenberg came out, right? <laughs> Yeah. But only own steroids, major steroids. So, um, you know, the great thing was it really leveled the playing field for a lot of industry and a lot of people. The bad news is there's a lot more people out there going, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me, which means that you need to learn how to differentiate yourself and cogently and elegantly explain, this is why you need to be talking to me. This is what I do differently than the masses out there. Now, if you can't do that, you're just going to be not ahead of the curve. You will be running with the crowd around the curve. And worse yet, if you don't do any of it, you'll be running behind saying, what just happened, right? <laughs> so uh, I tell people, learn how to market. Everything you do is marketing. Everything. I don't care if it's telling your significant other, selling them on going to a restaurant or on a vacation spot. It can be whatever, just whatever you need to convince somebody to, to go in your direction, that's marketing, right? In its most basic terms, right? Now, I will tell you that there's so many great marketing uh courses and materials and things to learn it, that it's silly not to take advantage of it. So I would say, if you're going to say, no, nope, I'm only going to pick one skill, Brian, you just tell me which one it is, because I refuse to learn any of the other ones, marketing. Okay. But you can enhance those. And the other one is uh, speaking, because they go hand in hand, especially in today's world. You are talking on YouTube or videos or whatever. People will watch a video before they'll read, okay? Especially if they're commuting and looking on their phone, right? They'll watch a quick two, three minute, maybe longer video, right? So learning how to speak and uh, make, making it cogent and enticing and making them want to take the next steps uh that's like super powerful and how do you do that i tell everybody the there's one place i tell everybody to go if that's what they want to learn how to do right and do it learn it as fast as possible and that's toastmasters mm -hmm. toastmasters when i got turned on to toastmasters i was in my early 30s and i had a uh horrendous experience my worst nightmare speaking in front of a group of people at a, a college class I took and it was the most harrowing experience I when I left that night I was like oh my gosh I'll never put myself through that again that was the most nervous looking at Toastmasters and so I did and little did I know that was going to be a major game changer for me and it not only helped me in in my professional life, but also helped me in my personal life and 
and it spills into so many other areas in your life if you don't even realize it, you know, it gives you so much more self-confidence when it's there, was the transformations of personalities. So that's what usually ice water runs through most people's veins. Oh no, I can never do that. Right? Yes, you can. And it doesn't mean you're not going to be nervous when you get up and talk to people. You just they say in Toastmasters, those butterflies in your stomach, you learn to make them fly in formation. So you use that energy for your benefit. So, uh, so what did I say? Writing's the other one. You think, oh, what? Well, I don't write. I don't want to write a book or anything. Yeah. Do you write emails? Do you write texts? Do you write business letters? Do you write, you know, summaries, executive summaries, or anything like that? Brochures, marketing materials? Yes. You need to learn to write. It's really, really important. And if you don't, well, okay. Can you still survive? Yeah, probably not as well as you probably would if you would have taken the time and energy to, to focus in on it and learn the fundamentals and, and start getting good at it. And it's like anything else in life. Some people say, ah, no, I wasn't born to be a writer. I was, no, nobody's born. How do you get at it, right? So, and then the, the fourth basic one I tell people is learn sales, how to sell. Well, what do you mean, Brian? I don't want, I'm not into selling. I hate salespeople. Selling and sales has changed dramatically in the last even 10, 20 years. It's not selling, you know, uh, something to somebody that they don't want, right? That's not sale. That, that to me is just being a snake oil salesperson. That's not a, a real salesperson. So a serial salesperson today is more of a consultant. And um, I read somewhere, to paraphrase them, that if you explain the problem that the prospect has that they may not even know they have yet, then you've automatically, uh, and you, you explain it cogently and elegantly, you automatically have the ability to show them what you, you have to sell them what they need, right? Uh, you know, if it's going against your conscience, you know, then you're probably not selling something that you're, you know, <laughs> that they really need or want or whatever. You're trying to convince yourself. And so I, if I, I recommend people, if you're doing that, get into some other thing that you believe in and you, you know, that you would uh, sell to your grandma or your, grand, or your mother or something, you know. So with those four things, you could really be a powerhouse in any industry that you go into and be a real asset. And if it's your own business, you've got a major head start than the vast majority of the folks out there starting a business. Yeah, that's definitely music to my ears for sure. I think you hit on all the, the right notes for sure. And I especially like, I've never heard the expression uh, butterflies flying in formation. So I think that's a great uh, analogy that I'm going to use in the future. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to talk to you. Yeah. I want to talk about mindset and go back. We're going back a little bit, but it's also talk about Toastmasters because it's the fear that comes up with learning new skills, right? Like I'll give you an example of my mother, you know, she got divorced when, um, you know, I was a adult. So, and she'd been out of the workforce for 25 years, but all of a sudden she has no money now. And she's, she was forced to try and learn new skills and, you know, you know, life changes. And when you've been doing one thing for so long, it's really hard to kind of shift your mindset and, and get over that fear. So what tactics can you use to get through the fear part and, you know, get out there? Excellent question. Uh, and that is what holds most people back. And um, we all have had it and have it and deal with it in different forms and what have you. But uh, one of my favorite sayings is look fear in the face and it will cease to trouble you, right? So what I get out of that is your, um, 
imagination, your anticipation, your uh, conjuring of, you know, the worst case scenario is, is always coming up. And uh, you've got to, it, they've actually proven scientifically that you can desensitize yourself to fear. So once you do it the first time you're fearful and you do it and you go, wow, that wasn't so bad. And you do it again and it gets a little less, less and you're a little less sensitive. It's in, in Toastmasters, I remember the first talk I gave when I, uh, right, I should say, I think I remember because I was so fearful and terror struck that I, I, I remember people saying to me, hey, you did a great job, good, good job. <laughs> I was like, I don't even remember what I said. I was so nervous, you know. But as you do it on a regular basis, especially in a setting like that where people are actually supportive and all there for the same reason is to get better at it. But uh, even just taking on small things, uh, micro wins, like I was saying before, you know, if you're fearful of whatever, I mean, pick a, pick a, your favorite thing that you, you think uh, talking to a certain person or could be uh, putting yourself out there, doing something that takes some uh, courage to uh, get yourself to do it. Well, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier about exercising your courage muscles. Okay, when you're exercising your courage muscles, what happens? It gets stronger and stronger, right? So uh, when you see an opportunity that is fearful, just do it. Just take, hey, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go talk to that person. I'm going to go, you know, introduce myself to that person over there. I'm going to ask the boss for a raise. I'm going to go do whatever, the, whatever the case may be. What's the worst can happen? They say no to you. Okay. Well, you still survive. You're not going to die. Right. But it's like, I like to tell people, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Right. Mm -hmm. So go ask. You never know what's going to happen. Something better than what you thought was going to happen might happen. So it's just getting yourself out of that mind frame that you allow fears to start crowding in on you. And you just gotta say, hey, every time I do one of these, I'm gonna uh, uh, make myself do it. I'm just gonna go ahead and push myself out. And what you'll find is every time you do it, you get a little better and a little stronger and a little more courageous and until you're willing to do some crazy stuff. There was a, there was a story I read about this guy. I think he actually wrote a book about it. And um, he was this fearful guy that was went into sales and he couldn't sell anything and he ended up getting fired. And uh, he said, and his, his boss asked him, why couldn't you sell anything? And he said, I just get fearful when I get in front of people and I have to ask him for the sale. And he goes, you need to get over that. Go figure out how to do that, right? And he just kind of wished him all the best and <laughs> shoved him out the door. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna start desensitizing myself to fear. And he started like knocking on doors and saying, hey, can I uh, kick my soccer ball around in your backyard? Cause I know you, these lots are bigger and some people said, get out of here. But then he'd find somebody say, sure, go ahead, go back there, right? So he'd have them take a picture on his phone of him playing soccer. And so he had all these, um, I guess, what do you want to call them? Mementos, right? Pictures of him overcoming all these fears until he started feeling invincible. He was asking crazy stuff. And he, what he found is if he asked enough people, he'd get to do it, right? <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting study because what he was actually doing himself is desensitizing himself, right? So that's really, it's not a, you know, I wish there was some magic phrase or something that you could do. But the fact of the matter is, is, uh, courage is not absence of fear. It's working, uh, doing it um, in spite of it, right? You're doing it in spite of the fear. You know, that's why I always like that title by, uh, what's her name? Susan Jeffers wrote the book, uh, you know, what's the name of it? Uh, Face, the... I can't remember. I know, I know the one you mean though, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, I'll think of it in a second, but it's basically... We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, do, do it... Do face what you're afraid of and do it anyway, or something like that, or something like that. 
Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, it is a biggie, but uh, you have to remember something. One of the big things, especially when you're younger, in a saying, somebody that told me this when I was in my late 20s, I was, went to work at this place and um, there was an older guy who was retired there, semi-retired. He was still working because he said, if I went home and spent all my time at home, my wife would divorce me. So I went out to lunch with him one day and I was lamenting to him about how somebody in the office heard from somebody about something I did or said or something that was a wrong thing. And I felt really bad about it, right? It wasn't a very, really egregious or anything, but it was bothered me, right? He says, let me tell you something. He says, in your 20s, you worry about what people are thinking about you. In your 30s, you don't care what people are thinking about you. In your 40s, you realize people aren't even thinking about you. And it's true, people aren't thinking about you. <laughs> They're thinking about themselves, you know? And if you just kind of get over that, it's like, oh, okay, I got nothing to worry about. Don't worry about. You know, what do you care? I always say it's none, it's none of my business what people think of me. It really isn't. They're entitled to their opinion, you know? So um, you can't take it personal, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say here. I want to talk about Greek philosophers because that seems to be a theme in your book. And it seems like I get the connection, but it could also be a little bit strange because you know, what can Greek philosophers tell us about a problem that they probably never, well, I know that they never faced, um, you know, 2000 years ago, 2000 odd years ago, more, a lot of times. Um, And why do you draw inspiration from, from the Greeks? More the Stoicism, uh, those things that you see, if I have quotes in there that I quote, those are what I call eternal truths, uh, universal laws. You, know, you don't have to uh, believe in them as a prerequisite for them to work. You, you just, they work regardless, like gravity. You jump off a building, you're going to hit every time. It doesn't matter if you believe in it or not, right? And so that's like, that kind of always gravitated towards uh, those types of uh, aphorisms and what have you, because it kind of resonates with me. It's kind of like, oh yeah. And um, like, yeah, I could always, I always knew that, or that's a great thing to, great handle that uh, to grab onto and and use in your, or tool or whatever the case may be. But um, but one of the things I talk about in there too uh, is, uh, you know, they were great believers a strong body, strong mind. And I try to emphasize that is like, if you have a strong body, if you, if you're focusing and making your physical being strong, your mind, there is a direct correlation to that. Okay. So I'm not saying you have to be some, uh, Olympic athlete or superstar or anything. I'm talking about just taking care of your physical built being, what you're putting into it how you move your body. It's very important to move your body. Uh, and so, um, and it gets more and more important as you get older and you don't realize it, but it starts, you know, when you do start getting older, you start realizing, whoa, I better keep moving and keep in action here. Cause my father's 88. He still exercises every day. He walks a few miles every day. And he says, if there is a fountain of youth it's to stay moving stay in action keep your body moving and it's true it really does because there's a direct correlation to energy out to energy in right so um i think that answers your question about the greek thing yeah uh, (laughs) Uh, so shifting a little bit i want to talk about mandatory age uh, retirement and what your thoughts around that? Is that something that's still necessary? Because I'll, and I'll tell you another story that my, my aunt was working for Deloitte and her, for her mandatory retirement was 65. And she still has, you know, she still could be working and still contributing to the company in ways I think, a, you know, a younger person um, cannot because she has all the experience and all that knowledge. So is that something that as a society we need to look at and, and think differently about? 
Absolutely. Um, first of all, the, the whole age thing is really kind of morphing because people are still, for, they're living a lot longer. They're taking better care of themselves. Health uh, care is, uh, and nutritional uh, qualities and what have you are, there's a lot more knowledge about it now. And people are living more uh, productive, long lives. And, and um, so to say you need to retire at 65 is kind of a, it's a outdated, antiquated uh, rules that were put into place. And the other thing that I think a lot of companies are starting to figure out, not all of them though, but uh, that, um, there's no replacement for experience, okay? You cannot AI that, you cannot uh, read a book about it, you cannot pretend, right? Because this computer up here that you've been running for the past, whatever, 25, 30, 35 years in your industry has collected a lot of data, all right? Minute amounts of data that will tell you what you may even consider intuitively you were reading, but it could be all those synapses that connected and say, this, this isn't feeling right or looking right or something's wrong here, or this looks more like this issue, right? You don't get that without experience. That's where, and then there's life, then there's the other aspect of it, which is the life experience. Life experience, it's all, you can't just say, you know, oh, you just learned this and that's all you need to learn and you're great. No, people are people, they're complicated, <laughs> you know, mechanisms, so to speak, you know, that you got, you, you have to, you're still dealing with people, right? And you're still people by people, right? If people like, you know, and trust you then you can help them make decisions. And because they, you've, you've gained a, they've gained a comfort level with you, right? And I don't care what business you're in. I, and I've taken on probably four or five uh, interns. Uh, they call them runners in our business, right? Mm -hmm. But it's kind of an antiquated, but because they do the legwork a lot of the times, right? But I always took it very seriously because I always uh, would say that you're not just learning about uh, the real estate business. You're, this is a people business. I don't care what business you go into. This is about people. Yes, the commodity happens to be real estate, commercial real estate in my case, but, but there's a whole bunch of other factors that come into play that you need to learn and know, right? And uh, that's why I was always hesitant when people came up and said, Hey, I've always wanted to get into the business. Could you train me? And, you know, it's like, no, because I, you know, I, I have to be really, really convinced that that's what they want because uh, it's so much that goes into it. And I take it very seriously. I didn't, you know, usually they're with me for three to four or five years, you know, working with me. So um, at any rate, getting back to that, original question. It's, it's kind of silly in today's world. It's, it's uh, ageism is kind of like, are you kidding me? You know, this is like, let me tell you something. There'll, there'll be a point in time where, uh, you know, if you're in your 20s and you're really good at it, they may still replace you because they've got an AI uh, uh, that can take your place, right? So that's why I tell, and you were smart when you pointed out, hey, everybody should have a second choice or a second uh, alternative in case their first alternative runs out on them or goes by the wayside or gets outsourced or whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, more about the people side of things? Because I think that is super important. Um, and something that is not taught in a job setting. So that's potentially something that people need to learn by themselves. And so if people, and we've established people skills are important, how does one go about learning those skill sets? Well, I think 
obviously it's certain industries lend themselves to being able to do that. Uh, I've always told people that, look, if you want to be a, a business person, right, and you want to be really good at it in a certain industry, then find somebody as a mentor that you really resonate with that you can add value to and say, how can I, I really want to learn this industry and I really admire what you've done. And is there any way, anything that I can do that can help you or even better is here's what I can do to help you. Can you teach me about the industry? And, it, and, and you really want to vet them out and make sure it's somebody you want to learn from, right? You don't want to learn from a crook or some shady characters. I mean, you want to learn from somebody that's really good at what they do and are, are, are good, have good people skills, right? And are sincere and wanting to help others, right? Those are the ones that are the most valuable. When you hang around people like that and you're watching them and you're observing them in these scenarios in your business, then you by osmosis will start picking up these nuances, right? And then you'll be able to produce similar results with your, with your efforts, right? And I was very fortunate to be around some very, uh, really, really good, smart people. And I watched them very carefully. And I was also aware of the fact that some of the ones that I was working around, I wanted to make sure I didn't conduct my business like them, right? So, you know, you can learn from everybody. I always say, you can learn from everybody. It could be maybe things that you don't want to do. You know, these are the ways you don't want to do business or whatever, right? But uh, I always say, if you want to be an artist or a, whatever it is, a musician, a business person, hang around those that you admire and uh, pick up their habits and skills and, and all of their little idio, you know, whatever you want to call them, secrecy, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, don't pick up their idiosyncrasies, but pick, pick up those, those skill sets that, and nuances that really that you notice differentiates them and makes them better at what they do. And it's, here's the interesting thing about it is when you run into people that do that, they're, they're usually open to wanting to share those with you. Not everybody wants to accept you as, you know, their apprentice or whatever, or be their mentor, but, but you can explain it in such a way that, hey, I'm not saying I, you need to hang out with me eight hours a day. If I could call you once a week or every two weeks for a half hour or whatever, and run some things by or by email or by phone, however, whatever you're most comfortable with, I'd really, really appreciate it. And then I'd like to buy you lunch once a month to sit down and go over the stuff that you told me I should be doing. And so you could kind of, you know, further coach me on, you know, how to, to, to improve. And you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people that would say yes to that, you know. In your book, at the, the latter half of your book, you talk about different jobs that could be potential possibilities. I think you talk about podcasting, you talk about writing, talk about affiliate marketing, digital marketing. And the first thing that I thought about when I read them was like, these are very young, like quotes, <laughs> I guess it's my bias, is that they're, you know, quote, young people jobs. Why, what made you recommend those jobs in, in your book? Well, first of all, um, those are relevant jobs now. They may not be five years from now or whatever, but really the idea was to get people to say, well, I don't know. I don't, all I've ever done was sell insurance or all I ever did was, you know, accounting or this, that, or the other, right? And it's like, hey, here's some things you might want to look at. Okay, does that mean you're gonna embrace it? No, but the idea was to get people's wheels turning and saying, uh, well, that doesn't sound too bad. I wonder what that's about. Like I said, the book has many chapters, 48 of them, and then action items at the end of each uh, chapter. If you wanna delve into it, some ideas, you know, to delve into it further if you like, either books to read or Google this or look check this website out or whatever the case may be. Call these, this type of person up and ask them or 
whatever. There's not that many of them. I think there's maybe 14 or 16 uh, uh, types of jobs that I put back there. But, you know, any of which people could start working on if they actually resonated with them, right? But uh, I think, you know, the big issue for a lot of people and will be is they get stuck. This is all I've ever done. I don't know what else to do. I can't figure out. Well, it's not, you're not stuck. Okay, first of all, let's change that term because you're not physically stuck someplace. Mentally, it might be a little tricky, but I'm giving you some ideas in the book uh, to how to unstick your brain and start thinking in different directions, okay? And um, first of all, first and foremost, you've got to be willing and, and, and desirous of doing that, right? If you're not, is there, the bad news is there's no easy buttons to push, okay? <laughs> You've actually got to do some work and do some thinking and thinking, I always say, thinking is some of the hardest work that we can do, right? But uh, it also is our way out. If you start using your willpower with it and your initiative and start figuring out a way to uh, change things around for yourself because uh, what happens is some people just get in these endless loops of in their brain. This is all I can do, therefore I can't do anything else, therefore there's no use in looking, therefore I might as well just sit here and watch another Netflix binge of, you know, such and such or, you know. <laughs> so it's like, you've got to break yourself out of that pattern. And, um, and if you do, you will probably even amaze yourself because that's all it really takes to start going. But you got to continue. You got to build that momentum. And how do you build the momentum? One small step at a time, little micro wins. But as you start building on those, become very powerful, very powerful. I've seen people do it. I'm like, man, how the heck did they change so rapidly? And it, you know, <laughs> but uh, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, oh, I decided that. I watched a documentary or read a book or talked to somebody that convinced me and was looking, you know, whatever the case may be. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna give you one last question. Um, and this is when I ask all my guests and that is what, do you have a favorite book or one that you like to gift a lot? Yes, there is one that dramatically changed. And when it was given to me by a friend of the family, I was like, ah, this is not something I'm ready to read. You know, but thank you, though. I was you know, gracious. Thank you so much. Well, he ended up um, giving me a job across the country. And when I landed at the airport, I went from Los Angeles to Miami, where he was. And I got jumped in his car. He said, do you ever read that book I gave you? And I said, eh, I started it. I just couldn't get into it. And he reached in his back seat and he pulled out a copy and he gave it to me. And he said, here's another copy. I'm not going to see you for a couple of weeks. But when I come back, I want you to read a chapter a night. When I come back, I'm going to have questions for you. And I want you to have some answers for me. And that's when I said, okay, well, he's trying to help me out. I better at least do that for him, right? And amazingly, what happened was I got into it, and, as, and it was the hardest physical job I ever had in my life. I mean, I was get up at 6 in the morning, go to work. I'd come back at 6 at night. I was doing hard physical labor. So the last thing I really wanted to do was read at night. But I'd come home, take a shower, eat dinner, and then I'd go right to my room and and read a chapter. And what I found is as I was reading the book, it was drawing me in and it was like little epiphanies kept coming up and saying, oh, I always knew that. And wow. Yeah. I always thought that was the case. And it's like a little tuning fork going off in you. Right. And by the time I got to the end of it, I was like, whoa, this is, I've got to look into this more. And the name of the book is Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm. And 
the book is a spiritual classic and has been was credited as in the top 100 books of uh, the last century. Uh, Steve Jobs, when he passed away, uh, left a copy of it underneath everybody's chair at his memorial service. It was the only book he ever had on his iPad. And he read it every year. And I've read mine every year. And I also listened to the audiobook, which Ben Kingsley did. But George Harrison of the Beatles was friends with Ben Kingsley and asked him to create the audiobook for him. He did a masterful job. But it was just such an eye opener for me and mind opener. And the reason you read it every year is because you evolve as a person. So you read things that you may have read dozens of times, but all of a sudden, bang, it hits you like a lightning bolt. You go, wow, now I get it. <laughs> you know? So um, that's one book I carry with me. I've turned dozens of people onto that. I've never had anybody say that was a horrible book. I mean, it was just, it's a, it's just uh, a wonderful, wonderful book that I just can't say enough great things about. Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And uh, do yourself a favor and get yourself a copy if you haven't read it already and you'll be glad you did. I know I said that was gonna be the last question, but what uh, one or two things did you get from that book? If you can that, you know, consolidate them. I know yeah, I mean, there's so many things. It's hard to really just say one or two, but really the, the main issue is that there's only one God. And, uh, and like I said at the beginning, call it infinite intelligence, call it the universe, call it whatever you want. I choose to call it God, right? But um, he is the source. She is the source, however you want to uh, characterize it. And um, when you tap into that, you're tapping into uh, the, the universe's knowledge, right? So all the answers are there. I mean, we come into this world and you get to a point where you say, why are we here? It's not just to live, have a family or go about our business and get old and die and go away and never, you know, that, that's, that can't be it, right? <laughs> and you, and you, you get to the point where I really want to know what it is. Well, what is it that we're seeking? Well, we're seeking joy and happiness, right? We're not seeking out little colorful pieces of paper with pet dead individuals on them or something like that, right? We're, we're, we're trying to get what the end result is, right? And that's, what it buys, but you can't buy happiness. That's that's the irony of it, right? Happiness is a elusive thing. You get it by they say you want to get happy, go help others become happy. It's a it's a it's an after effect, right? But I I digress there. Really, the source is God. And we'll never be happy until we get back to that source. And if you only look around, you find the people that are going after their first million, 50 million, 100 million, billion, 5 billion, it's never enough. When I get that yacht that I've always wanted, when I get that house I always wanted, when I get that person I always wanted, when I get that bank balance I always wanted, well, what happens when you get it? They're happy for a little while and it dies out, right? Then gee, why aren't, why aren't I happy? Why? Because this world is designed to point us back to God. So to say, oh, it's my religion that gets us there. No, it's like Yogananda says, it's like a mountain. And the mountain has different paths to go up to the top, which is where God is, right? So none of that doesn't make it wrong because one zigzags and one goes in a circle and one goes up straight, you know, whatever. But it's all, we're all trying to get to the same place. So to, to say to somebody, no, you're wrong because your religion doesn't, believe what my religion is or whatever and it's silly right so if you learn the universality of it and you learn to meditate that's what I learned from the book not to meditate but I, I that was my introduction to it and then I 
started following and took the lessons and then I started meditating. And that was a major game changer in my life. It really changed the way I approach life and uh, look at it and feel about it. And you just, you get so much more out of it. And people say, well, explain meditation to me. I say, okay, you have to sit down and you have to still the body, still the mind, but imagine I have a glass of water here and I take two scoops of dirt and I stir it all up and I hold the glass up and you see it, it's all muddy water in there. But if I set it down and I let it sit still for five or 10 minutes, what happens? All the dirt settles down to the bottom. You have clear water again, right? Well, that's what happens with your mind. When you learn to still the body and still your thoughts and you're calm, you think much more clearly and you're able to come up with solutions to your life problems and issues and things out there. And you're tapping, tapping into the source. And we talked about your faith and your courage muscles, what have you. That's another muscle that you're using, your mind muscle, right? That when you first started doing, I remember the first time somebody sat me down and tried to get me to meditate for three minutes later, I was wiggling around and how can you do this? And now I, I'm up to an hour in the morning and an hour at night, you know? And I wouldn't change it for anything in the world because I end my day and I start my day totally calm, totally at peace. And uh, it's that port in a storm you are able to go to when life's uh, starts hitting you from all different angles. It doesn't mean your life becomes, uh, you know, simple and easy and, you know, nothing ever is going to happen again. It just teaches you a way to uh, be able to handle whatever's thrown at you, which is a beautiful thing, let me tell you. <laughs> so I can't say enough about learning how to do that. That's just something that if you're not doing it, you're giving yourself a big handicap to go through life with. So, I'm glad I asked that last question for sure. So much great insight, so much, so much great advice. Um, Brian, thank you so much for being on the show today and for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom. Congrats again on your book. Uh, for people who thank want to reach you. out to, you. to find you, uh, where, where's the best place to look? Uh, you can, my email is Brian, B or com. And, uh, I invite people to call me all the time. So my number is 818-371-0311. And, uh, I love getting calls from people and helping people. I mean, it's, it's, if I can just part with one last thing, it's about, we're here to love and serve. Okay. And if we're serving God by serving others and you're, you're giving love instead of, you know, hate and just negative, spewing negative stuff, that, that's only going to attract more of that. That's what we were talking about earlier, the universal laws, right? Well, you were here to love and serve. If you make that part of your pole star, your life and your daily routine, there's no way you're going to lose out. You're, you're going to you're going to attract a lot of beautiful things. And so that's what I'll, I'll leave you with. And uh, I appreciate you having me on and, and uh, would love to be a guest anytime on your show. You're, you're a master in what you do here. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for listening to Publishing for Profit. Please like and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.